Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I welcome you to another episode of our series, Sirati Rasul Lessons and Morals. In our last episode, we were discussing the incident of the marriage of our Prophet وسلم, with Khadija. And we were talking about some of the blessings of Khadija. Khadija indeed is a very, very noble lady. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said in a very beautiful hadith Many are the men who have perfected their faith in Allah. Many are the men who have perfected their Iman. But there have only been four women who have perfected their Iman in the history of mankind. Four women. The first of them was Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun. The wife of Fir'aun was a Muslim. Fir'aun was the worst human being. And his wife Asiya was the most pious woman of her time and one of the most pious women in the history of mankind. The second was Maryam the mother of Jesus Christ. Mary, Maryam, the mother of Isa. The third was Khadija, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu And the fourth is Fatima, his daughter. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, these four women have perfected their faith. And that is an honor given to Khadija. And it is also narrated that once Jibreel came to the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while Khadija was there. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told her, Jibreel has come to me to tell me that Allah has prepared a house for you in Jannah where you don't have to toil and you don't have to work and it is made of gold and pearls. So Jibreel was sent by Allah to give the glad tidings to Khadija that Allah has a special house prepared for her in Jannah. And this hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Likewise, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam always remembered Khadija for as long as he lived. Khadija died as we will study shortly in a few episodes Khadija passed away in the Meccan state. She never went to Medina. And when the Prophet ﷺ emigrated to Medina, he then married Aisha and other women over there. And whenever he would get some gifts, whenever he would get some meat, some good food, he would send it to the friends of Khadija and the relatives of Khadija. And this would incense Aisha. She would become angry. Why are you sending it to her friends? She would get jealous. And she said, I never got jealous of any woman as much as I did of Khadija even though I never saw her. So she became jealous of Khadija because of the love that the Prophet ﷺ had for Khadija. And once the sister of Khadija, the one whom the Prophet ﷺ used to work for as a shepherd, once she came to visit the Prophet ﷺ in Medina, many, many years later, when he was a Rasul, at this stage when the marriage took place, obviously the Risala had not yet started. Many years later, when that sister came and she asked permission to enter, the Prophet ﷺ became visibly shaken and disturbed. And he, you could see the effect on his face because he heard the voice of Khadija. It was not Khadija, it was the sister of Khadija. And he greeted her in a very nice manner and he gave her gifts and he showed her much, much sympathy and comfort. And of course, Aisha was there as well. And Aisha narrates this with a bit of jealousy and anger because it is only natural for this to happen. But this shows the love that the Prophet ﷺ had for Khadija. No one helped the Prophet ﷺ as much as Khadija did. And this shows us the status of women in Islam. Behind every great man, there is also a great woman. Behind every great man, there must be a woman as well in his life. And this is the case of our Prophet ﷺ. When the Prophet ﷺ first saw the angel Jibreel and he became terrified, he saw a strange apparition. He saw a huge being never seen before. He became terrified and he ran down the mountain. Where did he go? He ran home to his wife's house. He ran home to Khadija and he said, Khadija, cover me up. Khadija, cover me up. So he has that love for her that he wants to be comforted. He goes to his wife Khadija. And this is a natural emotion, a natural emotion that a husband needs the comfort and the protection and the safety that the wife offers. And the wife needs the comfort and protection and safety that the husband offers. And this is the whole beauty of the message of Islam. Men and women have complementary roles. Each one has a role to do in society. 
and Islam has come to perfect their rules. And so Khadija was the comforter and the supporter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also another beautiful thing about Khadija is that Khadija was the mother of all of the children of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam except for one other child. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a number of children. His oldest child was named Al-Qasim and Al-Qasim was born in Mecca and he died before the prophethood started, before the Prophet reached the age of 40. We don't know how old Al-Qasim was when he died, probably a few years old. And that was why the kunya or the nickname of the Prophet was Abu Al-Qasim, the father of Qasim. So the oldest son of the Prophet was Qasim. And then followed by Qasim came a number of daughters. There was Zainab, there was Ruqayya, Umm Kulthum, and the youngest Fatima. Zainab, Ruqayya, Umm Kulthum, Fatima. These are the four names of the daughters of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We should know these names and memorize them. Zainab, Ruqayya, Umm Kulthum, and Fatima. Fatima was the youngest and she was the most beloved of his daughters. All four of them lived to maturity. All four of them married. All four of them had children. After this, it is also narrated in some books that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had one more child called Abdullah or Tahir or Tayyib. The books of Sirah differ and that child also died. All of these were Khadija's children. So, and some scholars even add some more children. Allah knows best, but it appears that there were six children that Khadija had. One son at the beginning and one son at the end. Both of them did not uh, live uh, beyond a few years. And then there were four daughters, all of whom lived to uh, adulthood and they married and they had children. There was one more child of the Prophet Sallallahu and that was Ibrahim. And Ibrahim was born to an Egyptian maidservant by the name of Maria al qibtiya Maria the Coptic, and she was from Egypt. So, and that was in Medina, we will talk about that in a future episode. So all of the children of the Prophet except for one were born from Khadija. And this is yet another blessing for Khadija. One more point that this marriage to Khadija shows, there is a charge that non-Muslims level against our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They say, A'udhu Billah, we seek Allah's refuge for even saying this, but we need to defend his honor. They say that he was, A'udhu Billah, a womanizer and a lover of women and a person who wanted to satisfy these sensual desires. And that's why he married so many women. But you see, this one marriage to Khadija proves that this is false. The Prophet Sallallahu as a young man, up till the age of 25, never touched a woman, never touched a woman. And it is narrated that the other men of his time would go and womanize and go and drink and go and do what men do. But the Prophet ﷺ would avoid doing that and abstain from that. And even when his other friends would invite him, he would refuse to do this. And that is the sign of a chaste and noble person. And then he married Khadija, someone who was older than him, someone who was already widowed. She had already been married. She is not a virgin girl. She is not a young girl. And she already had another child from another marriage. She already had another child by the name of Hala through another marriage. And the Prophet ﷺ married her and then remained with her and her alone for 25 years of his life. At the prime of a man's passions in the 20s, throughout his 30s, then throughout his 40s, he did not take any other wife. And then when Khadija died, then he married Sauda, a very elderly lady. And then after that, he married Aisha. Aisha was the only young previously unmarried virgin girl that he married. He did not marry any other unmarried girl previously unmarried except for Aisha. And then all of the other wives that he had were all wives that had previously widowed or divorced. And there was always a very divine wisdom marrying a certain tribe or marrying for a certain reason. The fact of the matter is that the Prophet Sallallahu remained monogamous. He had one wife for 25 years of his life until he was 50 years old. And that is not the sign of a passionate, of a sensual man who, has, who lets all of the desires go out. No, this is not the sign of a, that type of a man. Rather, this is a sign of a chaste, of a noble, of a pure human being that he marries a woman older than him and divorcee or a widowee and takes care of her and remains faithful only to her without taking anyone else until he was 50 years old. And that is one way to refute this charge. And inshallah, in future episodes, we will talk about other ways as well. The next major incident, in fact, the only major incident to occur that we know of until the beginning of the prophethood, the next major incident is a very, very fascinating incident. And it is the incident of the rebuilding of the Kaaba. In a previous episode, we had discussed 
what the Kaaba is and who built it. It was built by the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam along with his son Ismail. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in Surah Al-Baqarah that these two prophets, father and son, helped one another to build the Kaaba. It is narrated that Ismail would bring the stones and Ibrahim alayhi salam would pick those stones and put them in place. And then when he needed to go higher, he took a rock like a ladder and he would stand on that, take the stones and put it up there. And that rock eventually became what is known as maqam ibrahim or the station of Ibrahim. And Allah tells us in the Quran, وَاتَّخِذُوا مِن مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى Take as this maqam ibrahim take it as a place to pray. We should pray behind maqam ibrahim when the crowd allows us to do so. That same stone still exists right in front of the Kaaba. It is the same actual stone that Ibrahim himself thousands of years ago stood on to build the Kaaba and then later on he would worship Allah Ta'ala on that stone. We need to take a short break now. When we come back, we will continue talking about the rebuilding of the Kaaba. Stay with us. Welcome back. We were discussing the actual building of the Kaaba. And we said that the Prophet Ibrahim along with his son Ismail were the people who initially built the Kaaba. Now, one fact that many people are not aware of is that the original structure of the Kaaba was not a square. Rather, it was a rectangle. So two sides were longer than the other two sides. It was a rectangle. What happened was when the Prophet was perhaps around 35 years old, five years before the beginning of the prophecy, a flood came into Mecca. It rained heavily. And Mecca is in fact at the bottom of a number of valleys. And this is something that when you go to Mecca, you will see it. The car will go up and down and up and down. And when you get right to the Kaaba, the car will go right up and then it will go down there through the road to get to the actual Haram, the actual Masjid. It is at the bottom of a number of valleys. So when it rains, the water comes like rivers, like torrents, like streams. And I have seen this many times. Whenever there is a major rain, a major thunderstorm, a major deluge comes down, I personally have witnessed this, that the, the streets literally are flowing with water, like a current, like a river. And of course, this is temporary, and then the water dries up. The point being, it comes all the way to the center of the basin, which is the Haram, the Kaaba. And so in this particular year, it rained extremely heavily. And it rained so hard that the rain poured so much that the current was so strong that the Kaaba was destroyed totally. The Kaaba became demolished because of the rain. And so the Quraysh had to come together to rebuild the Kaaba. So they began to bring in large rocks and stones from far away. Now remember, you want to use large stones, not just any stones you find. And so you need to go to a quarry where there are such stones and carve them out and make sure that they're good size. And then there are, there are no machinery or equipment there. This is hand job. So the people of Quraysh and Mecca all gathered together and they began working in the quarry to bring the stones on their backs all the way to the Kaaba, go back and carve it out and bring it back. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was amongst those people. He would physically go himself like all of the other men and do the manual labor like all other men. And this is something that should make all of us who work with our hands and do manual labor feel proud. There is nothing embarrassing. There is nothing shameful in earning an honest and clean living through manual labor. And of course, in this case, there was no living to be earned, but the rewards of Allah. You are going to be blessed by Allah for building the Kaaba. So our beloved Prophet Sallallahu helped in rebuilding the Kaaba with his own hands. However, a problem came up. In fact, two problems came up. The first of these problems was that when they gathered all of these stones together, when they reached the level of the black stone, now we're building the Kaaba from scratch. So you're building it brick by brick. When they get to around two meters high, there is the famous black stone. The black stone is the only original stone in the entire Kaaba from the time of the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. There is no other original stone in the Kaaba. That stone, the Prophet ﷺ told us, is a stone from Jannah. It came down from Jannah and it was as white as snow, but the sins of men turned it black. So in our times, it is black. This is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ said. That is a stone from Jannah that was white as snow and the sins of men have turned it black. And it is the holiest stone, the only stone in the entire Kaaba that the Prophet ﷺ kissed. That very stone, he kissed it. 
And so it is sunnah for us to kiss that stone, the very spot where the Prophet ﷺ kissed it, it is the spot that millions and billions of Muslims have kissed, and it is something that brings about rewards, not because the stone is holy, but because the Prophet ﷺ kissed it, so it is sunnah to kiss. So, this stone is the black stone, and it is the holiest stone of the Kaaba. When they got to this stone, each tribe said, we should have the honor of picking up the stone and putting it in place. We want to have this honor. The Banu Abd al-Dar, the Banu Hashim, the Banu Shams, the Banu Umayyah, all of these sub-tribes of Quraysh. Remember we said Quraysh is composed of many sub-tribes. They all said, we want to have the honor. We have done this and we have done that and we have fought in this battle. It should be our honor. And so they began fighting until they almost took out their swords that they're going to go to war. One of them said, this is not the way to solve it. Let us wait here. And whoever is the first person to enter through the door, we will leave the decision to him. Whatever he decides, we will all agree, whatever person. Now, of course, they were thinking that the decision would be based upon the tribe that that person belonged to. When that person, whoever he was, would walk in, he would choose his own tribe. So it was, as they say, the luck of the draw. That whoever comes in, it would be his tribe. So they said, we will leave it to him. Little did they realize that it would be none other than our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when he walked in, all the tribes became happy. They had a smile on their faces. They all felt he will choose us. Look at how much they loved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Even the other tribes who were not his tribe, the tribes other than the Banu Hashim, they became happy. And they felt, yes, this is the honest person. He will do justice in this situation. Look now, the situation has arisen which has almost led to civil war between them. The honor of putting the stone. Blood was almost shed. The Prophet ﷺ comes and they tell him the whole story. Instantaneously, he gives them the proper solution. Instantaneously. Look at the wisdom and the maturity and the intelligence that Allah blessed him with. What was his solution? He said, bring me a sheet. So they brought a sheet. And he said, place the black stone on the sheet. Every single tribe shall send a representative to pick the sheet up. Every tribe shall have the honor of picking the black stone up. Look at how the problem was solved. All of the tribes then picked up the sheet such that every tribe felt equally that yes, we have done it. And then our beloved Rasul Sallallahu himself picked the black stone and put it in the proper place. And this solved the entire problem and everybody was happy at the result. And that shows the wisdom of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Another problem arose. We said there were two issues. The second one was not as big as the first. And that was, what happened was that round about the same time that this flood occurred, a Roman ship had shipwrecked in the neighboring city of Jidda. Jidda, also called Judda. It is an ancient city. To this day, it is called Jidda. Very ancient port city. It was always the gateway to Mecca. Always, historically. In those days, it was a small port town. So, the Roman ship came and shipwrecked in Mecca. And it was well known that Roman wood, Roman timber was the best timber. Mecca obviously does not have large forests and trees. They don't have wood that is of decent quality. Whereas in Rome, they have good, authentic, solid wood. So the Meccans decided, we will purchase that shipwreck. We will purchase it from the Roman, uh, the Roman sailors and they can build their own ship. We will purchase that shipwreck and use these perfect planks of wood, use these beautiful thick planks of wood to also build the foundation of the Kaaba. So they gathered together and they started the fundraising and Abu Jahl announced that everyone should donate some money to rebuild the Kaaba, but make sure that the money that you give is pure money. We don't want the money that you have stolen. We don't want the money that prostitutes have earned. We don't want the money that has been given by interest. We don't want the money that you have cheated people out of. We are building the house of Allah. We want only pure money. This is Abu Jahl realizing that when you build the Kaaba, you cannot use evil money. Abu Jahl realizes this, that he is saying, don't give us your evil money. Give us your pure earned money. So they've got all of this money. They went to the seaport of Jeddah. They purchased the the shipwreck, the wood, and they brought it back to help solidify the foundation. But lo and behold, the wood fell short. They didn't have enough. The foundation could not be solidified with that solid wood that they needed. So they decided that, okay, temporarily, in the meantime, what we can do, 
we can build the Kaaba like a square instead of a rectangle. We'll build it like a square. And the portion that should have been the Kaaba, we will put some markings around it. We will put some markings around it. Perhaps later on we will get some money and be able to rebuild that portion. For now we will leave it unbuilt. So for the first time in history, the Kaaba was built like a square. And to this day, the Kaaba stands like a square. And that portion that they left outside, this is called the Hatim. And that semicircular portion is shaped like a circle. In reality, it should be shaped like a, in the sense that it is actually an added portion. But just to make sure that all of the, the rounds have been met, they have made it semicircular. In reality, the original Kaaba, as we said, was a rectangle. And this is all a part of the divine wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they didn't make the Kaaba upon the original structure. Why so? Because if one of us goes to the Haram in Mecca, we are not able to enter the Kaaba and pray there. And it is Sunnah to pray inside the Kaaba. The Prophet prayed inside the Kaaba once or twice. It is Sunnah to pray there, right? extra blessings to pray there. But what can we do? We don't go inside the Kaaba. Very few people have the luxury and the privilege of going inside the Kaaba. What can we do? Subhanallah, look at how Allah has made things easy for us. The original Kaaba, as we said, was a rectangle. That semicircular portion, the Hatim that you pray in, that semicircular portion is in fact the Kaaba. When you pray there, you are actually praying inside the Kaaba. And this is the blessing of Allah that He made it easy for mankind. You don't have to go inside the door. You don't have to fight and, and once in a while they open up the door and a few lucky, you know, fortunate hujjaj or, or people go inside. You don't have to worry about that. The same blessing, the same reward you will get when you pray inside this semicircular structure. And that is something anyone can do when you go. Any season you go in, you wait your turn in line and you go inside this structure and you pray. And in reality, you are praying inside the Kaaba. And this is a blessing from Allah that Allah willed this to happen in this manner. So the Kaaba was rebuilt upon these foundations, not the original foundations. And as we said, they put those structures and marks, and these structures and marks to this day they remain in the sense that that is the semicircular structure. Now this shows us that these incidents are occurring in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ in order to raise his own status. By choosing the Prophet ﷺ to be the one that arbitrated, automatically his prestige is going up. By allowing him to arbitrate and being happy at his decision, automatically his reputation and his prestige amongst the Quraysh is building up. And we see that all of this is from the uh, blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is also a symbolic message here. And that is that just like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has managed to unify all of these fighting Arabs in the building of the Kaaba. They were about to fight and he unified them. Eventually, he will unify all of mankind. The Arabs first and all of mankind and there shall be no more fighting on earth. And that's a symbolic message that he managed to do this by the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of this, as we said, shows us the status and wisdom and maturity and blessings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this basically brings us to the conclusion of the pre-Prophethood era. In the next episode, inshaAllah ta'ala, we will start talking about the beginning of the Prophethood and the first revelation that came down to our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm sure you're going to join me then. Until next time, I am your host Yasir Qadi. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> And I close my eyes And I'm floating along And I close my eyes And I'm drumming a song And I close my eyes